Good morning. I hope everybody here is well and feeling good. For me, this is a very exciting day to introduce Mike McDaniel and his family and welcome them to the Miami Dolphins. We are excited that Mike is here and we look forward to him working with us and Chris in creating a team that will win Super Bowls. First, we've got to start winning our conference games, our division games, and hopefully get to the Super Bowl. Um, that's what we've always said, that what we want is really a team that can win consistently. When we started our search, we were looking, for, we were looking to identify someone with, with several qualities that would have a real impact on our team. We were looking for those qualities of leadership, intelligence, innovation, and that could really understand what it takes to winning in the long run. Mike has all those qualities. First of all, he is probably one of the brightest uh, coaches that I've spoken to. He is really known for his innovation on the field, and many people in, in talking to him actually even call him a genius. Uh, that's, a, that's a big word and, and a lot of pressure on it. But certainly, when you talk to people, the first thing they'll say about Mike, he is innovative and he's thinking outside the box. But at the same time, the respect that he has commanded through his over 18 years as a coach um, is really, you know, remarkable. Um, I mean, we went so far as I had coaches um, in his former division calling me and telling me how great he was. And I said, why are you calling? He said, really? To get him out of the division. <laughs> so, I mean, it says an awful lot about the person and who he is. And, but one thing that really you'll find out that stands out about him is his passion for football, his passion how he approaches the game and how he works with people. Because that's what it's all about. It's really motivating, working with people, with passion and intelligence on a consistent basis that really will produce a winner. And I don't think we could find anybody, and you'll learn to see, with any more passion for this game and winning and winning the right way. So <clears throat> I really like to say that, you know, he, that as we work together, and I've always preached, it's really about a team, a team in every aspect. It's the players there, but it's really us as the um, owner, the general manager, the CEO, working together to produce a team and a team that, does, that is always doing the right thing. So, and I think, and just spending the time with him, I really feel that he is the person that can, really has all those attributes at the same time, can really has that football knowledge and the leadership for men that the Miami Dolphins really uh, will serve us really well in the long run. Um, he will continue to report as the old reporting to Chris Greer. Chris Greer reports to me and works together with Tom and me, actually, Tom Garfinkel, in, in really leading the Miami Dolphins. Uh, so, you know, with that, I, I look forward to, you know, continuing this collaboration and hoping that we are, you know, uh, in many winning our division and then going on to gr much greater uh, um, um, glory, let's put it that way. I guess probably that's the, probably the best word. So I would just like to now introduce uh, Chris Greer and uh, thank him uh, for all the work that he's done in this search. So, Chris. Good morning. Uh, first of all, Steve took um, basically all my jokes and thunder for everything on this and uh, to compliment uh, Mike, so um, this might be shorter than expected. Um, really, we're tremendously excited uh, to welcome Mike and his family here to South Florida as the leader of the Miami Dolphins. And, uh, you know, as Steve mentioned, Steve Ross, Tom Garfinkel, Brandon Shore, myself, uh, we talked to many, many very qualified candidates for this job in both pro and college football um, 
that resonated with us was how excited everyone was for this job and um, where our roster was, the talent level. Um, it, it was clear that there was excitement and even into the, the last two weeks, um, you guys would be surprised the people that were calling trying to get into this job. So, you know, for us, as we worked through the process, um, we interviewed, as we said, many people, um, did our research extensively. Uh, Steve was very calculated and, and made sure that we didn't rush this process. And, and that's a credit to Steve because there were times when I was like, let's go, you know, let's push this forward. And, and Steve was like, hey, you know, let's make sure we do this as thoroughly and correct as, as we can. So, you know, um, I, I, I thank Steve for his patience because, you know, I was ready to get going and, and, and get us going moving forward. Um, it, it's been a good month um, in trying to find the right man to lead the Miami Dolphins. And when we got through the process, you know, it was Mike McDaniel. And the one thing as we kept talking to everybody was as Steve talked about the football intelligence, uh, the innovativeness that he does. Um, you wouldn't believe the calls and texts like Steve said, just from players that he had connected with over the years, former players um, at his former team and um, agents calling us just about the relationships that he's built over the years and how respectful he was in terms of um, guiding those players through, you know, you know, dealt with adversity and things like that. So it's always good to hear you know, those stories because when you go through this process, everyone wants to tell you how great everyone is and everyone wants to tell you, you know, their warts that are trying to sell people. But uh, it was very genuine and everyone's, um, I guess, love and affection for Mike and, and how he had impacted people's lives uh, at his previous um, teams. So for us, when we got down to the decision, it, it was a clear choice. And, you know, I mean, you guys have all heard everything that's been about Mike, his intelligence, his passion, his work ethic. The people that have met him in this building here over the last, you know, 48 hours have all talked about the energy level and how he is. And um, he spent time, you know, new coaches come in, it's not easy. And they come and they'll spend five minutes with people. He's literally in there still talking for like an hour with people as I'm trying to get his attention on, on other things. And, and that's who he is. He, he, he wants to genu genuinely know who people are, connect with them, and, and get to the whys. And, and that's what makes him a unique person in terms of getting the best out of people. Uh, so again, we're tremendously excited to welcome you and your family here. Um, Richmond did a great job of uh, pushing me too, uh, you know, as we're talking about getting you through stuff and being patient because you guys had a great run in San Francisco. So, um, but again, we're tremendously excited and, uh, and, and glad you're the man to lead us here uh, over the next years.
You good? All right, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to stand in front of you guys here as the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. You know, any, any man standing at a podium like this would be honored. Would, um, it's a tremendous accomplishment. You'd feel great about that. But that's not why you get into coaching, is standing at this podium. You get into coaching because you love to coach football. You love to teach, and you love to make people better. And that's exactly who I am, who I have been, and who I'll be as the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. The, I'd like to thank those wonderful words um, from both uh, Steve Ross and Chris Greer. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and the responsibility, really, um, and it is a big one. But I'd like to talk about me coming here to Miami um, about a week ago. You know, I was coming um, here to interview for a dream position a dream of mine, and uh, that's what I thought it was. But as I walked through this building, the, the gorgeous building we stand in, um, saw the people, looked into their eyes, felt their passion, I quickly realized that this was my dream job and I had to go get it. Um, that one of the things that really struck me with the Miami Dolphins or organization was their interest in general. You know, it's a lot easier um, to uh, go after a guy after five other teams have interviewed him, put him on a list. You know, traditionally, that's, that's the way it works, where people want whoever other people are interviewing. This was not the case. They looked at me for me, and that really galvanized my interest um, in this organization and really told me a lot about who, um, who was really targeting me, told me a lot about what they were looking for, and that's why I knew it would be a good fit. You know, interviewing with uh, Steve Ross, Chris Greer, um, Brandon Short, Tom Garfinkel, it didn't take me long to realize this, this was the place that I was meant to be, um, so I better not screw this inter interview up. Um, you, take, you take a look at the facility um, that's built here, which is I feel like I'm in an SEC school. It's incredible. Um, the stadium, everything going on around it. I think it's a, it kind of epitomizes um, Steve's vision. And that vision is broad, it's grand, and it's trying to be great. And that's what I'm here to uh, get the football to. And that's what we'll do. And real, really, that's why I feel honor and I feel privileged just being up here in front of you guys today. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the immense amount of people that had to do with, with me even having this opportunity. You know, starting with Kyle Shanahan, Jed York, um, and his family, John Lynch, and the 49ers organization. They, they're a first class organization and really um, helped facilitate me coming into my own, I feel like. And it, without the players, who, who is the people that you really get into this business for, all their support, all their hard work, um, and, and their commitment, none of this would have been possible, and I thank all the 49er players as well. The, well to get in a spot like this, it's almost overwhelming to think about how many people are along the ride with you that if one of them doesn't decide to invest in you, you may never get this opportunity. You know, it's one of the great things about coaching and the coaching profession is it takes a village to just get one individual capable of doing a job like this. You know, I, I can go down the list, um, starting with Mike Shanahan, gave me my first job. Um, it was unpaid though, so he didn't pay very well. Um, Gary Kubiak, who gave me my first paid job with the Houston Texans. Kyle Shanahan, obviously, I, I would have, uh, I'm not sure what I'd be doing if it wasn't for him. You talk about guys like Sean McVay, Chris, Matt, Matt LaFleur, Bobby Turner, Dan Quinn, Raheem uh, Morris, Mike LaFleur, the list goes on and on. Um, I don't want to 
drain your guys' eardrums with that, but um, there's just so many people, and, and I appreciate all, all of those uh, men that helped me become the man I am today. The, uh, each, one, each individual that I mentioned and um, each, each coach have been really privileged to work alongside. They made me a better man, a better coach, a better teacher, and that's really what my focus is in life. They didn't make me a better father, I did that on my own. Um, I'd like to thank Richmond Flowers. It is surreal, man. Came a long way, and uh, you know how much I appreciate you. Um, Ann Noland, uh, this emotional day for me, um, and you made it somewhat coherent, I hope. Uh, Obviously, my family, my wife, Katie McDaniel. We've come a long way. We got a long way to go. Um, don't do that to me. I'm trying to do a press conference. Um, and uh, my daughter, Ayla June McDaniel. Um, you're a miracle, and I can't wait to see what you grow into. Now back to uh, what we're all here for. So football, okay, and the Miami Dolphins, and what you can expect from us, okay? Uh, schematically, offense, defense, special teams, you're gonna see um, a, unique, um, a unique design of everything that's tailored to our players. That's why it will be unique to us, because we'll tailor everything to our players, and that's first and foremost. But really, the, the the picture I'd like to present and what I'm here to do with the assistance of all these, all these wonderful people is create a brand of football here that is known as Miami football. And what that is, in my, Miami Dolphin football is all about passion, energy. You should be able to turn on the TV and know who the team is, even if the color's distorted. By, by the energy that they play with, by how they bond together, things that you only get with true work and bond together, okay? It's a team sport, and we're gonna play as a team, and I promise you that, we'll feel that. The whole, the whole thing that makes football so magical, the whole reason I've devoted my professional life to it, is you have all these people with different interests focused on one common goal, okay? That one common goal of winning, um, winning often, winning playoff games, and winning Super Bowls. Okay? And, that, and that goal is what drives us, but it's the bond and everything we go through in that process that makes it memorable and makes it worth doing what we do. It's the essence of sports, really and it epitomizes what the Miami Dolphins will become. It is, I feel unbelievably fortunate, and it is so exciting to come into a team um, of, uh, of energy, of youth, of talent, but more so of hunger that really matches the city of Miami, the, the fans, and every person that is employed by the Miami Dolphins. I felt it immediately when I walked in the door. It, uh, it gives me goosebumps right now. To be a part of something like that, um, an organization, this is my seventh, and I, I, I feel like uh, when you're hired and fired that many times and bouncing around the NFL, you get a, a glimpse at a lot, of, a lot of things, and you know when something has the ability to be great. And that's all I feel walking in and out of these hallways, and I can't wait to serve each and every one of you. I think collectively, the, the, one of the most powerful things um, within these hallways, within this organization that I think should be focused on um, is the, the lack of ego and, and the, the drive with a common goal. You know, I, I was in interviewing in this process, it's all about one thing. And, and that is a rarity, something special, and I am so fortunate to be a part of. But that collectivity and, and 
working together for, um, with a shared sacrifice is something that can't be replicated and I'm extremely fortunate to be a part of. Now, I think this is always odd because you're, you're getting all hyped up for um, a media session and then we just go back and study film, put, put uh, coaching staffs together, um, and uh, then get ready to practice. Um, hopefully we teach the players what, what the plays are before we do that. That, uh, that whole process, um, although it's anticlimactic, it, it is part of it. And, and I, can't, I can't express the gratitude um, to everyone to allow me to be up here and to be a part of it. Um, and there's no better time to start this whole process than right now. Thank you, guys. Or questions. Hey, guys. Um, we're going to take questions. We have two mics. Um, Brett and Renzo each have a mic. Raise your hand. We'll bring it to you. And please say your name and your affiliation uh, when you get the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, uh, Jim Barry, CBS4 here in Miami. Welcome to South Florida. Well, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, my question is this. Uh, did any of the issues <clears throat> raised by your predecessor in his legal action uh, raise any red flags in your mind about this organization? If not, why not? And if so, how did you resolve them in your own mind? Red flags? Um I can honestly say there was absolutely no red flags. And the reason why was because I was stepping into an organization with a boss that I, 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 don't, think, I don't think people give it its proper due. Steven Ross, there's a lot of people in professional sports you know, it's, that are out to make money. And I mean, I, I can't lie, I, I feel like if I'd spend that much money, I'd wanna make a lot of money. But like I said, when I walked in that door, you, you look at every single detail within this building, you look at, you look at the people that are hired, you look at um, ju just all the extents that there is nothing, there's no cost too high for winning for him. And when, when you're in multiple organizations, you realize that's not always the case. The, the city of Miami really, really is lucky to have an owner that right, wrong, or indifferent, all he cares about is winning. And as a coach, that's all you are literally working, looking for. That's all. So red flags? No, there's no red flags for me. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Cam Wolf, uh, NFL Network. Welcome to South Florida. What's up, Cam? How you feeling? Um, Obviously, when you start, the offense start, everything's going to start with the quarterback. What's your belief in Tua and him leading you guys into the next season? My belief in Tua is that he's a football player on this team that's trying to get better. And the biggest message I have for all players, really, the message should be about the team. And what I mean by that is it's really about the team collectively getting better and there's a responsibility of the quarterback to do so. But I'm not necessarily, I'm not sitting here concerned with how good Tua can be. I'm concerned with, as a collective unit, what we can grow together, because that's what wins football games. There, there's, I haven't seen a quarterback win a football game by himself ever, really. Um, he has to have somebody to throw to. He better not be getting tackled before he throws, so somebody better block. Um, and the defense better not allow them to score. But the, the biggest thing for, for me with Tua is that I want him to come and work every day, and I'm very confident that he will. I want to provide teachers that can develop him. I'm very confident in, in the people we're, we're, we're discussing this week and the, and the plan we have for that. And ultimately, all you want is a, is a guy that's driven to be great, a guy that's driven to get better, and it gives you a chance. Um, and it's my job to make sure that he has the best chance to showcase his talents 
Um, and, and, that, and that's everyone's job, really. Hey, Mike, Dave, hi to the Sun Sentinel. Uh, welcome to um, over we, here. There we are. Um, you alluded to earlier the Dolphins were the one team to talk to you for uh, interviews. How do you know you're ready for, for this job? What, what told you, okay, I'm ready to be a head coach in the NFL? Um, it's, it's funny that every head coach, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about being ready to be a, a, a new head coach, and, and I think um, – you guys have had new head coaches. The, the thing that kind of trips me up is every single head coach in the history of football has never been a head coach until they're a head coach. And for me, um, the comfort level within the hallways, I, the really, Really, it's every year of my experience, especially the last five years that head coach Kyle Shanahan in the 49ers, he really relied on me, allowed me to be uh, his right-hand man and, and opened my eyes to all the things that a head coach does. Not to mention all the other years where I've had great teachers, and the key for me is paying attention. It's right in front of me. And so, when I do get my opportunity, I've been fully aware whenever that day comes, the responsibility it brings, the, the responsibility you have to every individual that's employed in the organization, their families, every player. So the, when, when they called, I was, I was kind of nervous about an interview because I don't major in that. I major in um, connecting with players, teaching them, and helping them grow. But after getting the job, no, I, I feel, I know there's going to be things that I'm not, that, that are new to me, but it's more about being prepared for the moment because everybody has to have their first time to do it. And I know that I'm prepared for the moment. I know there's going to be things that are, that are new and challenging, but that doesn't make me nervous because I've been preparing for this my entire career. Hey, Mike, right here in the center. Will Manso with WPLG TV here in Miami. Welcome to Miami. You talked a lot in the last couple of days. I've heard clips about coaching is teaching, and that's something that you love to do in the individual players. But when it comes to managing 53 personalities, the emotion from week to week, the drama, the distractions, things that come with a team, how do you think you'll handle that? And what is your plan when you've got to handle so many people as one head coach? Oh, my plan is to handle it well. And, and how you do that is you just, you take, you know, coaching, any, um, coaching a position group. There's a transition to coach a position group, group to be an offensive coordinator. Um, that, that told me a lot about what I thought it was. And there will be a transition to coaching 53 men, which um, is, that's at the low end. There's also practice squad and training camp roster. So I'm, I'm prepared to coach more of those guys. Um, than, ju than just that, but yeah, there's challenges. Uh, but every step um, of the road, every position you hold in football, th that's what your job is. Anytime you ascend, you take on new responsibilities, but you're doing the same thing in terms of, oh, there's something unforeseen. How do I problem solve this? H how do, what messaging do these guys need to hear? Who do I need to connect with? Who, who isn't um, really coming along the team's, um, team's direction? They're all, they're all just problems. There's more of them, for sure. But that, that, that's why there's only one head coach. You work your entire career to do it. And that's why you have so many resources within the building. Why I felt so comfortable taking this job is because I feel completely comfortable with my knowledge. I know I've been preparing for this. That would have been irresponsible for me to have all these great leaders in front of me and not bear witness. But I also have a lot of people to rely on within the building. And when everyone's working in the same direction, yeah, there's going to be problems I don't foresee or I, I couldn't forecast today. But how boring would our jobs be if it was just monotony anyway? I embrace the challenge. Um, I know there'll be new things, but 
I mean, that's, that's been the, the task at hand my entire 17 or 18 year career. Hey, Mike, Marcel Louis Jacques with ESPN. Welcome to Miami. That's my fifth welcome to Miami, and I'm, I, I'm feeling welcome. I about to say, just trying to make you feel comfortable. That's what I mean. I'm just waiting for you to bust out some welcome to Miami and then finish the verse. I'm not going to do that right now, but maybe later on. Gotcha. Uh, once you get your offensive staff kind of put together, what do you foresee that collaboration process being like? Do you plan on calling plays yourself? Is that something that you're going to kind of delegate to your offensive coordinator or do you have another unique system in mind? I don't know. I plan on calling plays myself. Um, but one thing that uh, I've noticed um, in, in my journey is that successful play callers don't isolate themselves. Um, they utilize the people around them. That's what a head coach should do. You don't do, I'm not up here doing anything by myself or I won't be, you know, after this press conference ends, I'm not gonna be going into a hole and hanging out by myself and thinking about stuff. You're working with people. So the, the higher your leadership um, with, with regard to a head coach, the more people you have to lead. As an offensive coordinator, you call plays, but if you're a head coach and calling plays, you better be reliant and feel very good about the people on your offensive staff. So it's been a meticulous process. Um, I think uh, not as meticulous as this head coaching search, uh, uh, apparently, but um, it's been very meticulous because that, that's, that's what you're preparing for. You know, I know exactly what the season's gonna bring um, in terms of, you know, there, there are so many things that go on in the course of the season and there, there's stressors and you have to worry um, ab about um, kind of focusing the direction of the team, but that's why you spend this time in the off season finding the people that you can rely on, that you can trust um, and work with so they can help you game plan, help you solve problems. Um, we can get the best plan together. And then, you know, when the players own the plan, you're just calling plays, but they make them come to life. Hey, oh. Oh. Hi, Mike, Omar Kelly with Sun Sentinel. I wanted to ask you about your upbringing in the NFL, um, Gary Kubiak, Shanahan, both father and mm -hmm. son, uh, your background, West Coast offense, heavy run-based offense. Is that sort of a sample of, of what you believe is winning football in the NFL? And, and what do you think it takes to win in the NFL from a, from a play call standpoint and, and scheme standpoint? Uh, I understand what you're getting at with the question. I, I really like the question, but connecting it to winning, that's, that's a team deal. But for offensive, offensively, with regard to scheme, I have, I have an interesting story because I, you know, I started with Mike Shanahan and immediately went to Gary Kubiak. And it's rare to work um, 15 years in the NFL across six teams and have the same system. So in that, what, what you end up doing in the same system, you're not constantly trying to relearn how to do things, you're constantly evolving to the point you know, when you're at your fourth or fifth year within the offense, and then you go to your third team, now you're, you're reinstalling, so you found, th your, it's your third rep of first introducing the same scheme, while also, it's your, there's a completely different set of players. So within your scheme, you are tailoring it to whoever they are. Y you, you go, I mean, what was it, my second year in, in Washington, collectively, we. We drafted uh, um, Robert Griffin III and ran a bunch of zone read. You know how much zone read experience our staff had? Zero. And we didn't get, go, any uh, go to any clinics. We didn't, um, we, we really did it with the old, old fashioned hard way grind. And what that afforded all of us, when you're talking about all the guys that were there in Washington, is in our formative years, our, our minds are open to adapting to whatever uh, means necessary, to whatever player skill sets, all the way to the quarterback. So because of that, every single year, 
You know, people call our, our scheme so creative. Really, we're just adapting. We're adapting to defenses. We're adapting to our players. We're constantly evolving. And I think that's important. Um, and that's uh, a winning formula. I, th I think it, it puts players in position to succeed. And that's the key drive for the scheme. That's why, you know, it's, it's less trying to be creative for creative sake. It's more um, solving problems uh, in different ways and having different tools to, and abilities to do so. Hey, Mike, uh, Daniel Yafusi with the Miami Herald. Um, I found it interesting that in uh, Steve's comments, he said that you will report to Chris, who then reports to uh, obviously Steve and Tom. I mean, I was curious with the aspect of player personnel, uh, how much say do you anticipate having on that and how do you foresee working with Chris on that? Um, another attractive, thanks, thanks for the tee up. That's another attractive uh, thing about the Miami Dolphins is, is Chris Greer himself. Um, I think his rep reputation um, speaks for itself, but you know, I, di I didn't know him uh, that well. I knew of him and I worked with his dad previously. Um, but in a short amount of time, he, if you're picturing that scenario where you, re you report to a GM and you wanna work with him, I couldn't, I couldn't create an avatar better for, for my working relationship than Chris Greer. Why? Because he, he's of the same vision in that he just wants to win football games, and he understands that the players we acquire better suit the scheme. And it's been obvious in, in, uh, in a week and talking to him on the phone and, and really all the due diligence that I did um, before I got here, that he's not interested in um, ego. He's not interested in agenda. He's interested in in a bond with, with the head coach that's, that excels and that beats other people's bonds as GM and head coach. He, he wants a, 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 a tied together um, unit and he wants to grow together. So how much say? Um, as much as I want to talk, I guess. Because he, there, there's been no pushback. There's, um, and, and, and I don't ever foresee that ever happening. It's a very comfortable situation for a, co a coach to go in, into, and honestly, it just helps me worry about coaching football, evaluating players with him, having conversations, and growing together so we could collectively um, do the best thing for the Miami Dolphins. Hey, yeah. Mike, uh, over here in the middle, Joe Shad from Palm Beach. Uh, hope things go well. I will not welcome you officially. I appreciate the welcomes. I was just, you know, paying attention. I wanted to ask you about uh, what you've learned about the best ways to teach players. Um, that it's an evolving process. That, that, you know, I got into the NFL in 2005. Um, Twitter, Instagram, and ADD addictions weren't really prevalent or existed. Um, and that's just an example of how things change over time. I think um, the one thing in terms of studying the learning process in general is that people can attach to ideas when they're, when they're in a linear story or if you can tell a story and they can, you can go from point A to point B to point C. And I've been fortunate within this scheme to coach every single position um, in this offense and whether you're, whether you're dealing with different players or different personalities, that is one true common denominator, is that you have to, you have, to have a starting point of understanding that you can bridge to a ne next point. Um, beyond that, tape, video, edited cut-ups, and organizing them so that you can battle that ADD issue that, we, that was aforementioned. Um, those things are powerful things that will be prominent within um, with our uh, coaches that we that we really invest our time, but understand um, that how valuable the player's time is, how short term attention spans are. You better bring um, some energy. You better you better entertain them while uh, getting them to learn whatever it is. But you always have to listen. Ask questions see if they get it, and adjust.
Hi, Mike. Ruthie Polinski. I'm with NBC6. Um, I will say welcome to Miami. Um, Finally. Yeah, there you go. Um, I guess you've spoken so much about your mentors and colleagues and so many people who have had so much influence on you as a coach. Um, what are some of the leadership qualities that those men, maybe women, have impacted and influenced you? And how do you hope to combine those qualities with kind of your unique, fun personality? Oh, well, I didn't know it was fun. That's very that's fun to hear. Um, early on in coaching, uh, it's one of the reasons I feel confident up here today and, and, and what really has helped me go through the entire process um, of adjusting to different positions and, and growing um, as a coach was something that was said to me early. You know, you're, you're a, a college kid coming out of Yale, and I know Yale has really sick athletes, but um, when I was 23 and I was, uh, you know, I was in charge of, assisting Kyle with receivers, and, um, and, I, and I needed to coach Andre Johnson in his prime. And I, I remember thinking, like, all right, I think he's going to listen to me, but we'll see. And then you, you find out it's the simplest formula ever known to man, something you guys can all relate to, something that it, is why all the, this, this conversation um, uh, about will people listen or will people, uh, will he lead and stuff? It's a very simple formula. You establish with them early that you can help them with their dream. If you can, if you can establish with them that you have value towards their goal, I mean, they have unbelievable pressure on them with a, with a, a, a career span that they know is finite. So if anybody can help them towards their ultimate goal, goal of being on an NFL team, which is their identity, staying on an NFL team, making their career last longer, making money for their family, um, doing things for that, that are bigger than themselves. They'll listen to anybody with a pulse if you can help them. And, and that fundamental tool I've applied across the board with the, with the other, uh, a little mode of wisdom that I received, which is people respond to authenticity. So I've been working at my personality my entire career, which is what you're seeing right now. I, I, that was established with me early, that people can, can smell when you're trying to be something you're not, and people respect when you are who you are. And that, because that was given to me early, a tool, um, it, I've been, I, I was blessed to have that, have that instilled in me, and, and it's really carried me through every position I've had, every team that I've gone to, um, and so I know for a fact that it stands the test of time. Hi, Coach. Down in front. Mm -hmm. Josh Moser, Channel 7. Congratulations. We'll switch it up from Welcome to Miami, wow. even though I would love to say Bienvenido a Miami. Oh, no, uh, you, you're ready. You're freezing me up. I don't know what to do. I don't do. know. For the fans, this organization hasn't won a playoff game in more than 20 years. Why are you the person that will be able to do that? I mean, why not? Like, it's not, it's not about me. It's about, it's about me, um, my relationship with players. But it, it's, it's not an individual ordeal. This is, this is a, a community of people, a whole group of men. And it, to me, it, I... I see it as an opportunity, really. I, you know, I know you, you know, it's obvious to me how true of, of football fans the Miami Dolphins fan base is because they haven't um, won a playoff game in 20 years. But you can feel the passion, you can feel the interest. And that just makes it all the more exciting because how great will that feel when collectively we, we can get it done? And that, and that, that obstacle is more of something that can really facilitate um, the, the end goal because it's a, it's a bigger prize. And it, you, you just don't worry. I mean, what does the last 20 years have to do with this year? I, unless we can take some of those points from those years and apply them to this year, it, it's irrelevant. It's a group of men trying to do a common goal um, 
and I, I don't really look at the, the the past history except like, hey, it's just going to be that much more gratifying for everyone, and the players can feel that, and um, I think the players and the coaches alike, that, that will really galvanize them to go after that. Hey, Mike in the back. Mike in the back, what's up? <laughs> I'm Yanni from WPBF, oh. West Palm Beach. How are you? I'm good, how you doing? Good, I know you were in a different conference and you didn't play the Dolphins last year. How much of their game tape did you watch or have watched since you were preparing for this job? And do you feel fortunate to inherit a winning team? Most first-year coaches aren't in that situation. Um, I, I, I'd hope I'd watch a lot of it, and which I did. And um, you know, I, I did play against the Dolphins um, in 2020, and we don't need to talk about that game at all. Um, I, you know, I'm the head coach of the Dolphins now. We kicked the 49ers um, something. But, no, that's, it's part of the process. You need to know what you're getting into. You need to know, you need to gather information to understand what the, the team has gone through. You know, it, all, all the game tape, all the situations, it's important to me to understand what to emphasize moving forward. And um, I, what I saw was a defense I didn't want to go against. What I saw was a, a collective group of people that, um, that, I, I could, from the tape, I knew they loved football. And that is such a key component that people undervalue. Because there's so many dollars, there's so much, there's a lot of fame out there for players. But the teams that win, the people love football and you can feel it and um, it's visceral. And to, to win eight cons consecutive games, I think it was, to, to end the season um, is a test. You, you could see players playing hard. You could see a defense that, again, I'm, I'm glad that is our defense. Um, and you could see a ton of talent, guys that weren't listening to the noise, that were trying to win games, and there's a lot of guys that want to get better. Offensively, there's, there's tools, and the, my job is to make, to help facilitate with all the other coaches and players to put together a, a, a product that, that reflects um, really what the Miami Dolphins are about. We're gonna go two final questions here, Safed and then Hal. Hey Mike, Safed Dean, USA Today. Um, your ethnicity has been a topic of conversation since uh, your hiring. I wanted to ask, um, how's your experience growing up as how you identify um, how, how has that experience been, and do you think getting a job like this set an example, sets an example for people just like you who have the same life experiences? Yeah, it, it's been very odd, to tell you the truth. This idea I, of identifying as something, um, you know, I think people identify me as something, but I identify as a human being. Uh, it, it, and my dad's black, so whatever you want to call it, um, I know there's a lot of people with a shared experience, but it doesn't make, you know, it, I'm just, it, it's weird that it comes up because the, the you know, I've, I've just tried to um, be a good person and I think, I think my background opens my eyes a little bit. Um, I don't have any um, real experience with, with racism because, you know, I, I think, you identify me as something close to, I don't know. Um, but I know my, my mom experienced it when she uh, married my dad. I know my dad experienced it, and that's in my family. But um, I guess that makes me a, a, a human being that can identify with other people's problems. I know question, Hal. Hi, Mike. <clears throat> Hal Habib with the Palm Beach Post. And I will say for the last time, welcome to Miami. Um, I, want, <laughs> I want to take you way back. We all read the stories about you riding your bicycle to Broncos practice. Um, what was it that made you want to do that? What, what made you go from being a fan to possibly a student of the game to trying to learn from what you were seeing out there? What inspired you to get into this business? Oh, I appreciate that question. Um, side note, the irony is um, that story 
um, my address was on 27th Avenue in Greeley, Colorado. And here we find ourselves, 27th Avenue. So um, uh, it kind of brings it full circle. But, you know, it's interesting being um, an, an only child in, in anywhere really, but um, in Colorado, I, I grew up in a town of, of like 70,000 people. And um, I didn't really have much to do. Um, I guess there was a park with a lake with a lot of um, goose droppings at that I could go play at. But other, other than that, like, the Broncos were the big deal. You know, that, that was, um, and again, w when I was younger, um, it, it was cool to watch something where there was guys from different ethnicities working together. It was the first picture I had of that, um, which, you know, I, I noticed when I was at my grandma's house that it was, hey, so that was kind of intriguing, football in general. I like football cards. Um, and I was just obsessed with the Denver Broncos at the time. So all I wanted to do was get autographs and be around them. And I was, I was and continue to be a pretty obsessive compulsive. So I'd ride there at seven o'clock in the morning and, and get as many autographs as I could and stay there till seven at night and ride back home. Um, but when I did, in doing so, um, I think it built up the game of football in my eyes. I think I had an appreciation for um, the amount of work guys did because I'd get there at seven and I'd watch them um, walk from the cafeteria to, um, to uh, I can't remember the, the facility's name, but to the gym and get dressed for practice. Then I'd watch them go practice. I'd try to get autographs when they'd come back in behind the yellow rope and then I'd, watch them go to the lunchroom and then turn back around and go do the same thing again in two days. And I think it, I think it built sort of this um, idea that cool things you have to work for in, in that process. So um, I, I wanted to be a pro football player, uh, and, but I, I had, a, I don't know, I had a good awareness level at a young age. Um, you know, the story is true. I wrote inside my, hel in my Little League helmet that I will be in the NFL someday. And I had every sticker of every single team. I didn't say I'd play in it. Um, and, you know, the, as, as you get older, you just figure, you figure out that, hey, if you want to be good at something, you better be passionate about it. And my OCD made me passionate about one thing, and I chose to go after it. 